one stranded ship, one giant problem for global trade. It could take weeks to free a cargo vessel wedged across the Suez Canal. One of the world's busiest shipping routes is out of action. So what will be the impact if the blockage isn't cleared soon? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Global shipping has been thrown into chaos because of a mishap on a major waterway. The Ever Given, one of the world's largest container ships, was blown sideways and became jammed on the Suez Canal in Egypt. That's created a tailback of other cargo vessels carrying billions of dollars worth of goods in both directions between Asia and Europe. Egypt says it hopes to be able to dislodge the ship soon and reopen the canal. But experts fear it could be weeks before that's possible. Other ships may now have to reroute which would mean a much longer journey to their destination. Charles Stratford reports. 400 meters long and weighing 200,000 tons, stuck in what's often described as the most important shipping lane in the world, a maritime accident with global implications. The ever given container ship became wedged across the Suez Canal on Tuesday when high winds blew her off course. About 12% of global trade passes through the 193-kilometer-long canal, which connects the Red Sea with the Mediterranean, providing the shortest link between Asia and Europe. The vessel, carrying around 20,000 containers, is registered in Panama and operated by Taiwanese transport company Evergreen Marine. It was sailing from China to the port city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands when it got stuck. The Japanese owner has apologized, but says the situation is extremely difficult. At present, the traffic along the Suez Canal has been disrupted due to the incident, and local authorities are working on resolving the issue using tugboats, but there is no estimated time for it to be resolved. This image, posted on a ship tracking website, shows the backlog of at least 150 vessels stuck in the northern entrance of the canal at Port Said, in the middle, in an area called the Bitter Lakes, and at the southern entrance at Suez. The vast majority of oil from the Gulf is transported to Europe along the canal. Oil prices rose sharply on Thursday. Industry experts are warning of a flood of insurance claims covering the vast amount of cargo being held up. Egyptian officials say at least eight tugboats are trying to dislodge the vessel, which experts say could take days, if not weeks. Containers may have to be offloaded in order to lessen the weight. Ships now face the prospect of having to travel thousands of additional kilometers around the southern tip of Africa, a huge cost and potentially delaying delivery of goods by weeks. The ships that are stuck uh, throughout the canal and at the north end uh, are in a precarious position and they may, may not be able just to turn around and take another course as long as it, and expensive as it is to go from the Mediterranean around Africa and vice versa. The Suez Canal Authority says around 20,000 ships passed through the canal last year, earning Egypt billions of dollars in toll fee revenue. The Ever Given is one of the largest container ships in the world, but for every hour and every day it remains stuck and stationary. There are concerns about the financial fallout and impact on global trade. Charles Stratford, Al Jazeera. Let's take a look at why the Suez shutdown is creating more than a few ripples in the business world. About 30% of global container ship traffic sails through the waterway. An assessment by Lloyd's List shows $9.6 billion worth of daily marine traffic is being blocked. The canal is a big earner for Egypt's economy, contributing more than $5.5 billion last year. All right, let's bring in our guests from Oxford, Guy Platten, Secretary General of the International Chamber of Shipping. Here in Doha, Mohammed Al Masri, an Egypt analyst and associate professor of media and cultural studies at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. And from Brussels, James Moran, former European Union ambassador to Egypt, Jordan, and Yemen. Thank you all so much for joining us. Guy, let me start with you today. This incident really shows just how much global supply chains rely on shipping, doesn't it? And also, let me ask you, just how massive are the implications for global trade right now? Well, I think, you know, your, your figures you've just shown, but 12% of total cargo volumes pass through the Suez Canal each year. That's over a trillion dollars a year. 
And as your report said, 10 billion uh, is held up each day. And so it's been three days so far. So you can do the maths on that. And also, they've got the, the hundreds of ships now, which are now lying at anchor, waiting to pass through the canal. And ship owners and, and managers are having to now take that difficult judgment. Do they now switch routes and take the long route round, which adds another 3,500 nautical miles to the journey and between 5 and 12 days to the journey times with the knock-on delays that will, that will result in, in that. So it's actually huge. And I think it shows you how strategic the Suez Canal is in terms of the waterway and how dependent we are that we are on it to uh, to have a the, the, the sort of the best most efficient supply chains in goods coming from Asia to Europe. Mohammed, just how important strategically and economically is the Suez Canal for Egypt? It's critically important. I mean, you ju you just can't overstate that point. I mean, it's important for strategic reasons, for symbolic reasons. Egypt has fought multiple wars um, over uh, control over the Suez Canal. Um, and so Egyptians view it sort of as a, a source of national uh, pride, a source of uh, national, or a symbol, I should say, of national independence. Um, but then economically, um, you know, Egypt brings in more than $5 billion in annual revenues um, as a result of uh, the Suez Canal. So it's a main source of foreign currency for the country. And, um, you know, it's one of the reasons why Sisi um, one of the very first things he did in 2014 when he took over as, as president was announce this uh, great expansion of the Suez Canal that he said would greatly, uh, uh, you know, he said it would double or more than double the revenues from the, from the Suez Canal. And, and that just underscores uh, the extent to which this is really just critically important for Egypt's economy. James, the Ever Given is massive. It's almost as big as the Empire State Building. Should a ship that huge actually be passing through the Suez Canal? Well, since they made the improvements uh, to the canal a few years ago, um, they've deepened the draft <coughs> in the waterway. And uh, uh, part of the reason for doing that was so that they could accommodate these very large ships. But of course, the challenges of navigating through the canal, and if you've been on it, I have many times, uh, are enormous. And you have to have a very precise um, series of uh, techniques and so forth to get uh, the ships through, especially when they're that size. Something here has gone wrong, whether it was the weather, whether there was a technical problem on the ship, difficulty perhaps from the piloting, the navigation, which is provided by the Suez Canal Authority, we don't know. Um, but it is a challenge, but normally it should work um, as planned. Guy, who's ultimately going to be held responsible for all this? <clears throat> well, clearly, at the start, the heart of it will be the ship owner. But in fact, all the people involved in the voyage. And, and I think, as, as James just said, we don't know yet what actually went wrong. So we need to establish those facts before you can start apportioning blame. But there's clearly many, many claims are going to go in over this from all the different cargo interests, from all the ships which are delayed. So there's uh, some huge uh, litigation coming down the line on this one. And of course, the, the knock-on effects to trade as well. Mohammed, as you mentioned in your previous answer, the Egyptian government ordered the Suez Canal to be expanded in 2015. But judging just by what's happened, was enough done in that expansion? I mean, if enough had been done, would an accident like this, would an incident like this have taken place? Well, I'm, I'm not a technical expert on, on canals, uh, canal digging, canal expansions, so I, I can't speak to that. Um, but what I can say is that CC presented this as an economic revival project. And the revenues in, I have the numbers here in front of me, the revenues in 2013, 2014, and 2015 were just over $5 billion. And in 2014, for example, they were $5.5 .5 billion. Not only have uh, revenues not doubled, they've stagnated. In 2020, the revenues were $5.6 billion. So there hasn't been really any increase in revenues, certainly nothing like the $13.5 billion that CC promised would be coming in by 2023. So that adds to, I think, the, the, the tension here. I think it adds to uh, the nature of the political crisis. And I think it's interesting that, at least as far as I'm aware, uh, you know, walking over here to do this interview, CC hadn't spoken on this. Um, and I think that's that's very striking. James, we've we've spoken about this already a little bit in this program, but you know, the Suez Canal 
It provides much needed foreign cash to the Egyptian economy, which has been struggling for quite a while now. How bad and how embarrassing is this incident for Egypt? And what's the importance of trade right now for their economy? Well, how embarrassing, we, we don't know, because we go back to this uh, point that um, no one really knows how this occurred, and we won't know for quite some time. But one thing related to that we think is very important. At some point, uh, once uh, the issue is resolved in the coming days or weeks, there has to be a transparent international investigation into what happened. Now, that will be difficult. As Mohammed has said, um, uh, Egyptians regard the Suez Canal with a very special uh, eye. It is uh, a symbol of the nation. It's a symbol of independence, as he said, for Egypt. So sovereignty is a big issue when it comes to these things. But in order to restore confidence in the canal operations, there will, I think, have to be an internationally-led investigation, including all of the relevant organizations, uh, going, down, uh, going down the track. Um, so embarrassing, perhaps. We don't yet know. Guy, I saw you nodding along to some of what James was saying there. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I think it, the most important thing is we do a full and thorough uh, investigation to establish the facts and exactly what happened. And only then can we learn the lessons and maybe see if there was negligence or, or, or failure at, at some point. But I think that's the most important point. We don't know exactly what happened. We've had lots of speculation at this point. What we do know is the ship is stuck fast aground and, and really the focus at the moment must be on refloating her and getting that waterway open again. Mohammed, what are the broader implications for the region? Well, I think it's, it's, it goes beyond uh, the region. There are global implications. In your lead up, you talked about uh, how much money is, is being uh, potentially lost on a daily basis um, from the canal. I, and I do want to just underscore the point that was made about the investigation. I think this is going to be critically important. It, it saddens me as, as an Egyptian, I'm, I'm an Egyptian American, but saddens me as an Egyptian that I have to acknowledge that this investigation does have to be international. I, I quite frankly, if I'm going to be perfectly honest about it, I don't trust uh, an Egyptian-led uh, uh, investigation uh, because this is a government that has proven itself to be uh, corruption, uh, corrupt and complicit in, in crimes um, against against uh, the Egyptian people and others. Um, so it's very important that this is an international, um, you know, sort of collaborative uh, uh, investigation. I think it's also worth underscoring that this is happening tragically uh, on a day when there is a uh, there is news of a, a horrible uh, passenger train crash um, in in Egypt that killed dozens of people, um, and we have to highlight that. The Egyptian government is authoritarian, and authoritarianism breeds corruption and inefficiency and incompetence. And unfortunately, Egypt has become a place of disasters. It is a place, unfortunately, where buildings collapse, where trains uh, uh, crash, and, and we're seeing what's happening in the, in the Suez Canal uh, over these past few days. James, it looked to me like you were reacting to some of what Mohammed was saying, and maybe you wanted to jump in. Please go ahead. Well, it wasn't so much what Mahabab was saying about uh, the situation internally, but you had asked about the region. Um, there are people that say that this sort of thing might actually have an upside. Uh, what has been going on uh, for the last couple of years, of course, is that in Europe, anyway, uh, people have become extremely concerned about being too dependent on the Far East and China for their supply chains. Now, this uh, incident shows just how fragile those supply chains can be. Um, the upside for the region could be, although I'm not going to, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it could be that uh, the so-called nearshoring, in other words, bringing the supply chains uh, closer to home, either back into Europe or perhaps in the Middle East and North Africa, might get a boost from this incident. Um, although uh, I, I don't want to be too optimistic about that, but I think it might be one of the aspects to be looking at in the longer term. And it's already something which is uh, beginning to happen. Uh, dependency on China in particular has reached the stage uh, in Europe uh, and elsewhere. The Americans, too, have a problem uh, where people, I think, uh, are thinking very seriously about rebalancing. And this incident may just be one amongst uh, other factors that uh, accelerates that process. Guy, this situation is really only further compact, uh, complicating the supply chain problems that have been caused by COVID-19. Um, how exactly has the pandemic impacted shipping? Uh, how dire did the situation get? 
I think the first thing is that shipping throughout the pandemic has continued to deliver the fuel, the food, the medical supplies, everything which has kept the world going. And I think we owe a massive debt of gratitude to the seafarers out there who've been manning those ships. And it's impacted the industry in so many different ways, from the shutdown of China in January, February of 2020, which had massive repercussions on the uh, on the sort of the, the, the factory shutting and the goods getting out. And then we had the, um, the threat we couldn't get our crews off the ship because countries shut down their borders and wouldn't allow travel. So we've had a, you know, shipping has proven to be extremely resilient, but it has shown incidents like this really do show how fragile that supply chain actually is moving forward. And I think that's a lesson that we, we can take away from this. Mohammed, this uh, pandemic and all of its uh, related restrictions have really limited the availability of dock workers and truck drivers. It's caused delays in handling cargo all over the world. I mean, how has that impacted the global economy? You know, I think that obviously the, the, the pandemic has, has affected, um, you know, the global trade uh, workers at the individual level, at, at organizational levels, and then at more macro levels at the state at the state level, um, you know, the nation, the, the level of the nation. Um, but what's interesting here is that Egypt hasn't been as affected in some of those ways because it hasn't uh, shut down in some of the ways that other countries uh, have, whether that's for good or, or bad, um, you know, in terms of the, the virus uh, and how the, the government has, has chosen to, to handle uh, the, the outbreaks that have, that have occurred in Egypt. You know that's for for other folks to to sort of decide. But uh, Egypt, from a, from just from a purely on the ground business perspective, has not been affected as as much as other places have been. James, is it clear yet what exactly has to happen in order to lighten the load of the ship? Um, if containers are going to have to be removed, how difficult that might be, and also is it clear if Egypt actually has the kind of equipment that's needed in order to accomplish this? Well, I'm not an expert on, on that, but I think we know that uh, if they have to start removing uh, the containers from the ship, it's going to take uh, quite some time, and some special equipment will have to be shipped in. I think they need a 200-foot-high um, crane to start taking those uh, containers off, and it's obviously going to be a very slow process. On whether Egypt has the equipment, don't forget that uh, the main work going on at the moment when it comes to the um, dredging and digging is being carried out by the uh, Dutch salvage company, which has been there before in the Suez Canal, knows the area very well. And they know what they're about. They're extremely professional. Um, and um, in fact, uh, when it comes to looking at uh, uh, the likely scenarios down the track, I think they're the first uh, ones one should listen to. They're the ones, by the way, who said it might take weeks, not 48 to 72 hours. Mohammed, I saw you nodding just now. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, the, as as he just said, the the, uh, the Suez Canal Authority, somebody came out and said it, this is going to be handled within 48 to 72 hours, and um, other international experts are saying that's perhaps too too optimistic. I'm also seeing reports that there are countries that are sending help or at least offering uh, to send help. Um, just within the last hour, I saw a report uh, that Turkey is willing to to send. Uh, one of its massive uh, ships that it says it can can potentially help alleviate uh, the problem. So, I mean, we're just going to have to watch it uh, over the coming hours and, and potentially days. Guy, are, are more and more countries going to need to look to alternative shipping routes now? I mean, for example, uh, Russia, there's, there's some speculation right now that perhaps they would use this to develop uh, routes in the Northern Sea, uh, Arctic routes. Uh, what do you think? Are more countries going to be trying to do this? Well, they're, they're doing that anyway, regardless of this. Uh, you know, uh, the Suez Canal still represents a massive shortcut for trade between Asia and Europe. So, you know, I have no doubt that when this blockage is removed, ships will still continue to use the canal. Um, because it, it is just the most cost-effective way of, of, of shifting the goods. But there's no doubt that, that routes are being looked at all, all around the world now as, as perhaps global warming, some of the effects of global warming is opening up some of those more northern routes. But it, it's what shipping is very good at is, is adapting to the circumstances. And that's what will happen here now as well. If this goes on for days and weeks, shipping will adapt and will just reconfigure its supply routes, although they will take longer and there will be delays as a result of it.
James, it's a significant sign of all the turmoil this has caused that the ship's Japanese owner has offered a written apology. From your perspective, how, how extraordinary is that? Well, I, I think uh, there may be a cultural element here. Um, uh, Japan, um, you know, has its way of dealing with these things. Um, and I think uh, he's probably trying to uh, cover himself uh, down the line. If indeed it turns out that this is down to human error related to the, or technical error related to the ship. Um, I don't know that we can read more into it than that. But as we've said earlier, there are many factors here and they really do need to be carefully looked at uh, in order that uh, confidence can be restored in the Suez Canal as a reliable conduit. But as Guy says, in any event, it's going to remain a major part of the infrastructure for world shipping and world trade in the weeks and months to come. But Egypt needs to think very carefully uh, at the top level, all, uh, everyone there involved, very carefully about how best to manage this and not, um, not uh, to take... Um, uh, a sort of hubristic uh, nationalist uh, line. Uh, it's very important that Egypt thinks very, very carefully and reflects on how best to uh, conduct uh, uh, the investigation to come. Mohammed, picking up on what James just said about how important it is for Egypt to really conduct this thorough investigation, um, and picking up also on your previous answer in which you mentioned that there were Egyptian officials that said that this all might be solved within 48 to 72 hours. I mean, where do you believe that shipping companies stand right now? Are they moving ahead with contingency plans? Do they think it's actually going to be weeks? Uh, uh, are some of them um, prone to believe that, you know, it might actually open up within the next 48 to 72 hours? You know, I, I don't know. I'd be guessing maybe some of them are going to watch Inside Story to see to see what we say. I mean, you know, I think that people are, are probably just waiting on pins and needles. I mean, these are people, these are folks that have, you know, millions of dollars on the on the line um but uh and, and you have these varying um analyses out there it, it might take a, a two or three days and it might take you know a few weeks and i think that at the end of the day uh you know nobody really knows i mean we hope that we'll have more clarity more answers uh in the in the next you know 24 hours or so um but um this is sort of unprecedented at least as far as i know for a ship this massive uh, um, to get to get stuck like this. I'm not sure when the last time something like this uh, has happened. So we're sort of uh, in uncharted waters, you know, no, no pun intended. Guy, in addition to all the economic implications, there are security experts who have indicated that perhaps, you know, ships that are just idling uh, in the Red Sea might become targets uh, perhaps for attacks, um, you know, amid tensions between Iran and the U.S. and other countries. Is that something you're concerned about? We're certainly aware of it. And uh, at the moment, <clears throat> we, we're not overly worried, but I think that's something that could change. But actually, just on the, the last point that you, you were asking, we know that companies are now rerouting their ships to go uh, around the, the long way round. And, and the longer this goes out, the more companies will make that decision. And even if it was cleared tomorrow, the canal, there's a, such a backlog now, it would take some days to clear that. So I think there's operational des decisions being made as we speak. And of course, even if they do route, there's some security issues there because ships will have to transit through the Gulf of Guinea, which we know there's a known piracy issue there, and also for the Gulf of Aden as well. So security is very much at the forefront mm. of, of ship owners minds when they're making these decisions and looking after, of course, the welfare and the safety of their crew as well. James, we don't have a lot of time left, just under a minute. Let me ask you the same thing. Are you concerned about the security of these ships right now? I think uh, what Guy has said, everybody's concerned about the security of the ships wherever they are. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, the situation uh, there in the Red Sea and up through the Gulf uh, uh, towards the Suez Canal uh, has, on the whole, been under control for quite some time. And, of course, I'm sure that uh, uh, the shipping companies are aware of this, and we've heard that. But uh, I don't think there's a special reason to worry about that part. And I agree with Guy. Uh, a, a greater danger, probably, uh, would be uh, possible attacks further south, through the Baba Mandab and down through um, off the coast of East Africa, where there has been a long history of piracy. Um, if they go the long way around, that's probably more dangerous than, than where they are at the moment in the, uh, in the Red Sea. All right. We've run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Guy Platten, Mohammed Al-Masri, and James Moran.
And thank you, too, for watching. You can see this and all our previous programs again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.